I hope everyone can hear me. Yeah, okay. Assalamualaikum and welcome to Beyond the States, the first ever collaborated event between the internal medicine and surgery interest groups of the Aal Khan University. My name is Salman Heather and I'm currently a fourth year medical student. Assalamualaikum uh, and my name is Mandar Abbas. I'm a third year medical student at AKU. So our guests for today are the two of our alumni from the batch of 2016, uh, Dr. Talha Saad Niyaz, currently a foundation year two uh, doctor at the Ipswich Hospital, and Dr. Ali Pathan, a foundation year two doctor at the West Suffolk Hospital. Without further ado, uh, the two of them will now talk about the general pathway to the UK. Over to you. Okay, great. So Ali, do you want to get started or? Um, yeah, sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Ali. Uh, so I'm Foundation Year 2 doctor. Uh, obviously, we'll go on to explain what that actually means. Um, I think uh, generally, I uh, hope everyone's well, uh, first of all. And uh, getting started, I think it's important to uh, get to know what exactly we're going to be talking about just basics so we'll be explaining the training process in the uk what that uh, curtails in terms of uh, the structure um the general and, uh, geography general, of the uh, uk and how applications yeah. work yeah applications how they work what's involved in that what they're looking from you uh what you get from training over here maybe a bit and uh how to get in Get your foot exactly, in the door, really. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, trying to get started, which I think is the key. Um, interviewing processes is something that we thought we'd uh, pay a bit of attention to because I think it's different between here and the US in terms of interviews. Um, then I think we, we didn't want to really go into comparisons between the UK and the US, but because we both haven't worked in the US. Having said that, I think we can we have a list of pros and cons to training in the UK itself. So we let the audience be um, the judges to see what whether it suits them over here or not. So I think that's something that we uh, wanted to make. Uh, wanted yeah. To uh, so to yeah. Uh, so I think uh, starting off uh, generally, what the UK is exactly is uh, well, it's four countries. So there's Scotland, England, uh, Wales, and uh, Northern, Northern Ireland. Ireland. So it's not the Republic of Ireland, it's a different country. Uh, so the process for the Republic of Ireland is totally different. That's classed in the EU. Uh, EU. Uh, Europe, we have no idea about either, but we can talk about the UK definitely. Um, so this whole kind of the UK is uh, split into, you could say, deaneries, uh, which are training deaneries. Um, just. Uh, so Ali had a good you. screen share. Uh, so, yeah, hopefully you can there. see that. Uh, so we have all these training deaneries and uh, essentially you can split. So uh, kind of you can say the region kind of uh, from se above 7-11 is essentially the whole of Scotland. So that's yeah. one deanery. You have eight, which is uh, our, uh, Northern Ireland essentially. Uh, 15 is Wales for you uh, over there and uh, B is essentially London, A is the Midlands which is around the Birmingham area and uh, then you have all the other deaneries. Uh, you can find this uh, map easily on uh, any of the websites uh, for foundation training the deaneries if you look for that. And, and I think the reason this is really important in this is in the sense that basically throughout the application for the UK, um, whether you're applying as an F1, F2, core trainee, or a specialty trainee, these deaneries still hold true. So the UK is divided into these regions. So when you apply, you apply to the entirety of the UK and you basically have to rank the regions depending on where you want to be. Um, I think now that Ali's explained this, we can go into how the training in the UK is structured as well. So I think, there was a little bit of confusion and granted, I think the, the system in the UK is different in the sense that um, it's not as straightforward from the outset, but once you're in the system, you realize that it is actually quite straightforward. So right off the bat, medical graduates over here go straight into their foundation year one. 
and have to do complete foundation year one and foundation year two. Now, what that basically means is that it's essentially called, it's like a house job, right? So you rotate between medical specialties, um, surgical specialties, as well as um, a community placement. Now, the community placement could be psych, it could be GP. Um, and this is basically to uh, firstly allow you to develop enough working experience in different fields and then also allow you to make your mind up in regards to what kind of training you want to pursue further on. Um, and that's why I think it was, that's why I think why we're trying to say that we're not specifically, currently I'm not a medical trainee. I will be a medical trainee in August, but uh, we are just foundation year doctors and that's how it's split. The, the next step from foundation, so after foundation year two, you apply for core training. Now, Core training in the UK varies depending on the specialty that you do. So for core training in medicine is three years and now they've switched the name to internal medicine training. So the application remains the same. The training remains the same. It's just a little longer. Um, and I'll talk to the, when the, when you split off into the uh, medicine versus surgery thing, I'll go into detail about that. And then uh, for surgery course, you apply to core surgical training for GP training, you apply to GP training. Um, you, same thing goes for psych and then obviously after so on average after two two to three years you'll then apply for specialty training which is then when you go into for example uh, gastroenterology cardiology um, deciding on whether you want to do orthopedics versus general surgery those kind of things so that's how it goes um, on average again these are there are variations between each field but on average specialty training lasts between four to five years um, and after which then you are, you finish your exam, your CCT, which is basically to finish off and then you become a consultant. Yeah, um, I think uh, that pretty much, uh, yeah, sums it up quite well uh, by Talha. Uh, I think it's just important to note that specialty training, when you're saying four to five years, uh, that's after you've done your core surgical training. Exactly. So exactly. it's not yeah. inclusive of your core surgical training. So it's two years of your foundation training two years of your core surgical or core medical training, yeah. IMT, that's two to three years. Yeah. And uh, following that, it can be up to six years of uh, specific specialty training in a certain specialty. And that could the be way, uh, respiratory medicine or orthopedics or yeah. vascular surgery, whatever you choose. And the way, the way it applies to, so Ali and I both came in as foundation year one doctors. So we started off over here. Um, we were lucky, I think, because both of us had British passports, so we could actually apply for those jobs. Um, but I think how it applies to most people coming from Pakistan, so it would essentially mean that you do your house job, which will be your replacement for a foundation year one, and then you start off as an F2, pretty much. That's how majority of the people do it. And then once they start off in F as an F2, then they, from onwards, apply for core surgical, for, for core training, basically. Now, there are different pathways, and I think that's one of the questions that we'd seen um, that was asked. So we'll wait for we'll we'll wait till we get to that point. I don't want to jump the gun too much right now. So, <laughs> so I think uh, I think yeah. I, so the other thing that we wanted to touch on just right now is that, like in most places, there's a difference between hospitals in the UK as well. So and it's important to know this split. It doesn't apply it doesn't affect you in terms of your training but it's important to know this split in terms of just i guess facilities available at each hospital so you have obviously yeah. tertiary care hospitals you have district general hospitals or what we call this dghs and then you obviously have primary care which is gps etc now tertiary care centers there's usually in each deanery so like as, as ali showed you um, in each deanery there are a few tertiary care centers and then those basically cater to the smaller DGHs. Um, and that's basically to provide more specialist services. So like transplant centers, um, neurosurgery, um, more advanced oncology and fields like that. Now, some of them, some small DGHs might not have, for example, in cardiology, PCI available and they refer to other centers. Again, that doesn't affect your training because every training over here does is that they do vary you. So they do make you rotate through hospitals as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think uh, that sums that quite quite up uh, quite well. But obviously, in terms of uh, different hospitals, in terms of DGH versus tertiary, obviously your experiences will be quite different. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, definitely. Um, so, so, I've, the, so I've been I've been working in a DGH. Tal has kind of experienced both. So yeah. uh, we'll be able to tell you kind of about that as yeah. well. We can. Yeah, we can. We can talk about that a little later on. I don't think that's the most important thing right no. now. No. So I guess, should we just, so for Salman and Manzer, should we just get started about getting into the UK and what you need to do? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So uh, do you want me to start with the questions? Um, I think, so I think if we could just, there are a few things that we need to make clear before we get on to, get on with the questions, I think. All right. I think the, the first question I was, I, the first thing that I wanted to touch on was basically, yeah, the training versus non-training jobs, okay? Because applications for both vary. So when we're talking about jobs primarily, you have foundation year training. So all stages of training are split into training versus non-training jobs, okay? Now training jobs is when you're an actual UK trainee and you're going through the program and their job is to train you, right? When you come in as a non-trainee or someone uh, for like a staff grade job, you could come in as a, specialist trainee, you could come in as a core medical trainee, core surgical trainee, or an F2. All of these non-training jobs that you apply for are basically you're stuck at one level. You have a specific contract and there's no responsibility for your employers to provide you training. You're there as service provision, right? So what, we're, what our goal for this thing was to try giving you the pathway that we feel is the best, especially for fresh medical graduates, to get into training, right? So that's why I think this adds on to the point about different pathways. There are different pathways available, but I don't think any of them are as reliable as getting into training as I, what I think is the one that Ali and I have done or, and what we will try explaining to you as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so I guess we can start off with how you apply to the UK. So let's say, do we start off as final year medical students? I, th I think that's I think that's a good starting point. Um, you get started. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, like speaking from our own experience, uh, from being a fin final year medical student, uh, looking at uh, the UK pathway at that time. Um, so it's kind of a, it's a journey of uh, kind of learning. Really, it's been for myself and Tala. Uh, kind of uh, no one's really come in and told us about this uh, the best thing I think was uh, all the information is freely available so in the age of information there's no kind of nothing you can't get in hold of in terms of the information you need and if you look it's there uh, so uh, once we were there we decided to apply for the foundation year one training so what that entailed is basically you're not doing your house job uh, you're doing your house job instead in the UK. Uh, so you start from uh, scratch, you're doing your whole house job year one, year two here in the UK. Um, and uh, at that stage, you, what you really want, uh, what they're looking for is, in terms of your application, is uh, you've not done a house job before, that you are uh, giving your PLABS or you're applying for your GMC registration, and uh, that you have the correct English requirements, uh, as in, you can prove that you speak uh, good enough English, which would be either through IELTS or OET, or there are various other methods of doing that as well. Um, we can get into the details later. And uh, uh, other than that, then you're uh, looking at giving the so in foundation year one, uh, when you actually start applying as an IMG, what you initially do is you apply for eligibility to apply to foundation training. So. There's an application process before you start get into the round one stage of the application. There's a process of applying for eligibility, whether you're eligible or not. Um, what that involved was uh, basically saying that uh, there's certain criteria you meet. So they don't sponsor you for visas for foundation year one training. It's important to note. Uh, we were, I think, I think it's a more matter of circumstance and fortune that we were able to apply uh, into foundation year one training. Uh, 
there are certain ways, I think, other than uh, being a British citizen, there may be one or two tiny so ways I guess, of really I guess, getting into it. So, like, people who have Irish citizenship, sh citizenship yeah. sorry, um, and um, people, for example, so my wife joined with me, so she had a spouse visa through me. So as a result, she could she proved that she had the right to work in the UK before F1. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's part of the eligibility criteria. I think there's one alumnus from our uh, batch as well who did apply for FY1. Um, and I think in the end, because she did fill a spot, they somehow did sponsor her for a visa. But I wouldn't say that's the most reliable way to do it. I think there are a lot more uh, clear-cut ways in terms of, um, yeah. applying to the UK, especially if you do your house job in Pakistan. Uh, um, official, officially, they don't, uh, it's written yeah, down on the website, sponsor, officially they don't sponsor, don't you, sponsor for you for a visa, so don't expect them to do that. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that's yeah. something, I, I think that's something that for people who are, who do have British citizenship or have a way to be, to come into the UK for, for work, or, or I think it is a good option to have. However, in the long run, I don't think it makes that big a difference as long as you start off in F2. Um, like Ali said, um, the kind of the, the requirements for F1 and F2 kind of hold true either way. So before we, before we finished med school, we had done our IELTS. Um, at that time, we didn't really know about the OET. So we did the IELTS. Um, once you do the IELTS and you meet the specific GMC requirement, then you basically, and the specific GMC requirement is a 7.0 in all of the categories as a minimum and an average of 7.5, I think. Is that correct, Ali? Um, so the GMC requirement is having, uh, uh, so you have 7.5 minimum in each yeah. uh, so, I'm sorry, the so the for foundation for the foundation uh, is uh, is a bit higher than GMC. So that's yeah. seven point five in each category and seven point five overall. Yeah. Uh, for GMC, I think it's seven point five in each. Uh, is it? Uh, yeah, uh, seven so. in each category. Seven in each category. A bit lower. Is an average, yeah. So, so average uh, seven point five. Yeah. Again, I think these things are all available online. So if I don't want to bog everyone down in the details and I wanted to create a general outline that you guys can follow. Um, so like Ali said, we did our IELTS, then we applied for our PLAB 1. Um, I think there were a few questions in regards to the cost of the PLAB 1. The PLAB 1 cost around, I think it was 200 or some 300 pounds between that amount. It's uh, just, uh, just, just uh, around between like 220, 250 pounds, something yeah. like that. The PLAB 2 is more expensive. So once you do your PLAB 1, and the PLAB 1 you can do in Pakistan, you do your PLAB 2. Um, the preparation time for the PLAB 1, I think I would say if you're busy, you can give it, um, I'd say just conservatively, I'd say take a couple of months. Um, it's not a difficult exam. Um, and you have online, so basically there's a PLAB group on Facebook that we both joined, and there was a past paper thing so like in AKU how you guys do the past papers um, I would say it's it's very similar it's very easy you get done with the exam yeah. and it's it's yeah. it's important for people to realize that the PLAB essentially is your ticket to getting into the UK it doesn't determine what you do or where you get in no one cares about the score it's basically yeah. okay you've done med school this is enough evidence that you've completed med school and have a baseline yeah. of information in your head and so you can come once you do PLAB 1, you book PLAB 2. And you have to be very smart with PLAB 2 bookings because the bookings go really fast. Now, the thing is, over here, I think right now because of COVID-19, the PLAB 2 has been cancelled, so that's affected a few people. Um, I don't think it's a long-term sustainable strategy on their end, so they're going to restart it 110%. Uh, yeah. Now, it depends how travel from Pakistan, obviously these things are going to affect it. But, so you apply for your PLAB 2. Before the PLAB 2, Ali and I came to England for a month. Um, and that was to basically do a PLAB 2 course. Right? Um, and there are a few PLAB 2 courses. We joined someone called Samson, which is basically a two-week intensive course. followed. It's very grueling two weeks, followed by two weeks of practices yeah. and tests. 
um, and then you basically come yeah. for your then you basically go ahead with your uh, flap two, which is basically an OSCE, and there are around eighteen stations, two rest stations, eight minutes per station. So once you do your flap two, you can apply for full GMC registration. Mm-hmm. After which, when you that's when you start applying for jobs. Yeah. So it's a big it's a big chunk of information we just gave everyone, but I think it's really important because that's the steps that it will that's a step that you'll take before getting into training. No, and someone just asked, we can't give PLAP two without house job. No, you can do. Uh, Ali and I gave it without that. Yeah. So uh, for PLAB, uh, for the PLABs, the requirement is you've completed med school, so you can't give it in med school. You can't you give can it. You can only med give school. it after you've passed med school. So. After you give your final exam and you've passed your final exam, not yeah. just giving it, uh, you, after you've passed your final exam, I should say. Yeah. yeah. Uh, inshallah, all of you will. Um, you're all smart. Uh, so, uh, and uh, once you do that, then you can apply for your PLAB 1. Uh, yeah. Once you give your PLAB 1, then you're eligible for your PLAB 2. PLAB 2. Uh, yeah. And once you, so the important thing for the PLAB 2 is before you, so if you're applying for a standalone, uh, for foundation job, uh, you need to get your GMC registration done uh, before you start your job. So yeah. your PLAP 2 needs to be uh, just, uh, you need to take into account, it takes about a month and a half to two months for your GMC registration. So yeah. you need to give your PLAP 2 in time early enough for that as for well. For the application, yeah. The application. And I think one of the ba- major holding points was getting the certificate of good standing from the PMDC. Mm. Um, so that's something everyone really, really needs yeah. to um consider before they apply so the timeline it again like any application is time sensitive especially for training jobs so let's say let's let, let's take the example of someone who's now finished med school they've done their house job how do you and i think that's talking for majority of people how would you then go about it so i would definitely say try doing your ielts plab 1 and plab 2 during your house job right so that way you can complete your GMC registration. So once you're done with your GMC, you'll, and you'll end up at the end of your house job, you'll end up with a full GMC registration. Okay. Yeah. So that's provided you've done the IELTS, PLAB 1, PLAB 2. Um, someone had asked right now, I've got the chat open about the difference between the IELTS or OET. Just, it, it, it depends on what you want to do. I don't think it makes much of a difference. Um, just You have to just go ahead and do one of the exams. Really. Um, yeah, once you're yeah. done with that, if your if your application is done in time, so I applied for a standalone F two job because I needed to move close to my wife. So I can talk from that aspect. So let's say you're doing your house job, you finished everything, um, and you're applying. So the application period, the eligibility will open up in in October, November. So that's when you put in all your documents. And people decide, and the standalone F2 people will decide whether you're eligible for a standalone F2, which is part of training. Um, and then after that, you'll go through, they'll decide whether you're eligible. After that, you'll go through your interview and you'll go through, then start ranking your jobs, which you'll get to later on. Um, the other way to do it, which I think makes more sense because keeping up with timelines is difficult, is that you basically do your house job, your and do your IELTS PLAB 1, PLAB 2 during house job. Um, and then basically apply for a foundation year two job. Um, it's a trust grade, staff grade job. Um, so it, it's not a training job as such, but because you're so, because you're an F2, they still obviously, they will always try training you, teaching you, etc. cetera. Yeah. Um, and all you need to do is basically, there are a few core competencies so that you need to get signed off before you apply for the next stage of training. And it varies from person to person for how long it will take them to get these things signed off. But once you get your competencies signed off by a consultant in the UK, then you'll be eligible to apply for certain, for core training, which is the next step. Um, so that's pretty much it. So essentially- yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, just for that, uh, the non-training jobs, uh, I think uh, in, it varies from place to place, obviously, from hospital to hospital, how they treat you. Yeah. Uh, as well, in some places, they will not treat you so well. Some places, a lot better. You'll be almost at equal standing as a training doctor, really. You'll get all the facilities, same facilities and everything. In some places, they will just treat you for service vision. Just, I think it's uh, 
but I can't say from experience because I haven't worked on all. Yeah, because we've both not been, we've both not had to encounter that so far. I mean, I've seen um, the good, the good side of things, so yeah. I can speak about and that. I think even in my hospital, they're very, very good. So they, their, their, their basic assumption is that anyone coming, even as a staff grade or trust grade F two, is coming to pursue their training later. Is coming to pursue long term training. So they provide you with basically everything that a trainee will have. You're expected to go to teaching sessions. You're expected to do your different courses during your F1, F2 that they will uh, help yeah. pay for you as well. Um, I think, yeah, so is that, is that I'm, again, it's difficult on Zoom to assess whether that's clear with everyone, but um, I think- Hopefully it's clear. Yeah, so I think the most reliable way to get into the system would probably be the IELTS, PLAB 1, PLAB 2 are not difficult exams. I think the issue would always be with getting annual leave during a house job and being able to go do your PLAB 2. You can accelerate the process and only go for two weeks, do a quick course and do some practice stations and try taking your luck. Um, the, the PLAB 2 is a, lot, is a lot of stuff based on communication skills. Imagine it basically yeah. like an OSCE. So I, I would normally say around two to three weeks minimum you should keep for the PLAB 2 to do a course in the UK. Or I think one of the guys is now doing a course in Pakistan and his name's Samson. So that's the guy we went to. Um, so you should take that time out. And then once you face, basically once you're done with your GMC registration, you're done with your house job, then you basically will, there's an NHS jobs website, right? Um, that's where all the job vacancies are posted. Um, and I had a word with a colleague of mine uh, from another university who applied a few months ago. And basically you apply to as many jobs as you can. So apply from, the jobs starting from F1, F2, even core trading jobs, just apply to them. And once a place accepts you, you then need to, um, then once they accept you, they'll, for example, give you an interview after the interview, they will then send you a certificate of sponsorship. Um, and then after that, it's a very streamlined process. So once they've accepted you, you've got the job basically, and that will be your F2 job or whatever post of job it is. And, from that moment on, it's very important for people coming into the UK to understand the kind of job they're coming into. This is not, this is a stepping stone onto better things. It's not your long-term, it's not a long-term job. So let's say you get a neurosurgery F2 job, right? That doesn't mean you're training in neurosurgery. That means you're just providing a service to the neurosurgical team. So you're a junior on the neurosurgical team, meaning you're just going to be helping out with ward jobs. They might ask you to scrub into theater every now and then, but it's very few and far between. So this is not neurosurgical training or it's not gastro training or whatever. Even if you're working in that team, it's basically a service provision and you need to get into training for them to then provide training to you. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I think that, that's a really important, important yeah. uh, point to highlight. Yeah. I think we should now move on to applications to the UK. So applications to mm -hmm. training and how they work. Yeah. Um, um, I, I think uh, if you don't mind me just mentioning yeah, yeah. one thing. So uh, when you look, talk about training jobs as well, uh, obviously once you do your non-training step as a stepping stone, get into a training job, uh, what you, some, in some places they offer academic training as well. Um, so that's basically kind of research blocks as well. So for people who are interested in doing that uh, along with their clinical things or wanting to do PhDs in research, things like that, that's a thing to consider. Yeah. Just thought I'd mention it. Yeah. So the UK has separate tracks for people who are very keen on research. So you have academic foundation programs, you have academic clinical fellows, and you have academic training as well for yeah. all specialties basically to allow you to pursue further degrees, et cetera, and research. Um, again, these numbers are limited. So these jobs naturally become more competitive as well. So that's something that we all have to consider. Um, moving on to applications to the UK. Um, I think the key to applications in the UK is to understand that it's a national, regardless of when you're applying, um, for training jobs, it's for training jobs itself. It's always a national portal, so it's called Oriel, where you apply, um, and essentially it's a very objective system. So 
you can't talk to anyone, you can't, there's no point of getting letters of recommendation. They'll ask for letters of recommendation in person, but I think that's more of referees as part of the application. So you have to just give them the email and then pray that whoever you put in the email will respond. Uh, the letter of recommendation, so it's not important in terms of getting the job. Uh, it's just, they, they, they get it to make sure you're a sane human being. Exactly, exactly. essentially. So they just want to know, make sure that you're not a risk to yeah. life. Okay. Yeah. Um, the other things that they look at in applications and it, the requirements in, increase with each stage of training. So because I, because we both applied for F1, one of the base things that they look at, even for F2 actually, so I'll talk about F2 because that's more applicable, is your ranking in your medical school. So which centile were you in? So were you in the top 10, top 20, top 30? All of these add points to your application. Um, things like poster presentations, whether it's local, international. Um, I know there's, a, there's obviously as much research as you want is very good, but um, for one peer reviewed article, you get one point. For more than two, you just get two points and then that's it. Yeah. Um, additional degrees you get. Um, so if it's a PhD, obviously you get, I think, a, significant, a significantly large get, amount of points. You get, yeah. you get six points or eight points, something like and that. And then for a master's, you get separate points. And, um, and then for uh, things like audits and quality improvement projects, um, those are very, um, those are things that I don't know. I, those are terms that I didn't hear much at AKU when I was studying there. And I don't think they apply. They, they, I'm sure they do them in Pakistan. And basically what an audit is, is comparing your standard of treatment to what a guideline says. So let's say yeah. you're talking about INR management. So people on warfarin, if you're, you can basically judge how people in your hospital are using the guidelines to treat people with high INRs and then make that an audit. And the way you turn something like that into a quality improvement project is, okay, I've seen that people don't really understand it. Let me try doing a teaching session to the junior doctors and see if that makes a difference. And then that's a quality improvement project. Quality improvement projects are very, very helpful for your application, uh, especially into the UK because they, they really, really believe in self-regulation of their management. So they're constantly auditing what they're doing and constantly yeah. looking on ways to improve themselves via the audits as well. What you guys should be treating it as is a tick box exercise to tick as many boxes for you to get as many points on your application. It's as simple as that. Um, yeah, I mean, you, 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 it's pretty much playing the game. Uh, yeah. So uh, other than that, so your audits don't really need to be hospital wide. Uh, yeah. Uh, so remember that it can simply be you're based on one ward. You can do an audit just for that ward on something really simple. Uh, prescribing of laxatives, uh, yeah, bowels opening simple. or or warfarin or you can go something more complex like surgical management and ensuring quality standards are met in terms of that. Uh, Even basic so, things like so, one idea I was given was going into the ward and checking how many people were on oxygen unnecessarily. Yeah. Right? Is, is, they, is that in properly? keeping with guidelines? Yeah. In, in, in keeping with guidelines. It's very simple. It doesn't have to be complex. But if you get that box ticked off, it's something very helpful. Secondly, just doing the audit isn't good enough. You have to present the audit. So you need to provide evidence of presenting that audit. It could be a local or national presentation. So that's that's the point system. The other thing that really counts, and I, I, I'm speaking through experience because I didn't think my application was very strong was for both standalone F1, standalone F2, the standalone F2 program that I applied to and for internal medicine training, the interview counts a lot. Um, and I think we've talked about, so the part that we previously talked about was all your portfolio. So things like, and over here, they're very big on your portfolio. So things like audits, quality improvement projects, research presentations, your actual ranking, extra degrees are all part of your portfolio. You can even, they expect, I think for, for future applications, they'll also expect things like demonstrating leadership. So people like Salman and Manzer who've arranged this thing, who are heads of certain groups in AKU and societies, that counts as leadership, claim points for that. Um, keep evidence. Uh, keep so evidence of that. So get letters from consultants yeah. or your, uh, yeah. like your patrons, whoever they are, things like, you've done this. Things like um, this, the, 
I remember, I think in in the first year of AKU, I tried becoming part of the what was it, the one of the mess committee, the committee for the that the room what was it uh, students lounge. Students lounge, yeah, students lounge committee. I was the rep, and I thought it was absolutely useless. Having said that, um, things posts like that actually being a curriculum rep, being all of these things will actually help. So apply for them. It shows leadership. It shows initiative. They look for well-rounded people, right? Now, one of these things, one of these things that I was told by an alumni who's worked in the U.S. and the U.K. and now we're going on to in the interview portion of application, is interviews in the U.K. From what I've been told by this alumnus is that they're very different, right? So they're very standardized interviews. They usually have three to four stations. Um, we can go into them. I think GP training has a proper OSCE type interview. So you have multiple stations. Medicine as training. Does, uh, as does things like ophthalmology. Ophthalmology, yeah. So it's OSCE those style. Are very, those are very specific for specialties. Yeah. Medicine training was very straightforward. There were three stations. They really, really care about your clinical ethics here. So I know we all didn't really care about ethics during med school. But it is something that, uh, at least I didn't pay much attention, but it is something that we do need to pay attention to because there's an entire station for the interview on clinical ethics. So things like confidentiality, things like uh, your um, non-maleficence, beneficence, all of these things are things that you need to pay attention to and be able to critically think in actual situations. So... Um, I think that's one, that's one scenario. One scenario is entirely on your portfolio. So that's where you have to basically explain what you've done and account for everything. So they'll ask you questions about what you've done and you have to show an in understanding as to what you've done and how that improves you and how, how you cater to the requirements. And then there's always one clinical scenario, which will vary obviously depending on what you're applying for. Um, the interview counts for a significant part of your point weightage system. So even if your application isn't that great, as long as you get an interview, you have a chance of doing well. Yeah. Um, and that's in your hands. Um, for the interview also, um, it's important to remember that, uh, well, in the portfolio station where they ask you about your portfolio is also where they will ask you about uh, yourself as well. Yeah. So things like your strengths, weaknesses, uh, why do you think you're suited to this job, things like that. So that's where they'll ask you that as well. And, uh, and it's important to know that this whole process that they have for the UK training is very uh, uh, stringent. It's, uh, they have the, written down exactly what you get points for, what you don't get points exactly. for. It's not based on anything you could get from knowing the person yeah. or anything yeah. like that. There's, it's completely meritocratous. So, uh, so yeah, even, if that makes so sense, if, so it's merit-based. So if you've worked in the hospital and supposedly one of the interview, your interviewers knows you, they will step out of the room. So they won't be part of your interview. So you can try your best yeah. to know program directors, et cetera. The only, the advantage of knowing people is to guiding, is guiding you. So know as many people as you want who can help guide you towards doing the right things with the application, maybe get you involved with things, yeah. but it's not going to help you get a training job. Yeah, don't don't get to know all the interviewers. Definitely not. Yeah, no. You won't have anyone left to interview. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, um, so yeah. So I think that's. So we talked about the portfolio, and I think that's one of the key reasons why I felt people should aim. If your plan is to come to the UK, then try getting into the UK as fast as you can, because that basically then helps you build your portfolio. Yeah. For and it helps you gear your portfolio towards what you want to do to store or if you want to stay in the uk and do certain things then it helps you kind of gear yourself towards getting into the system yeah, whereas yeah. if you spend majority of your training in pakistan you might not have a cv that is geared towards you working in the uk and so even if you have a lot of stuff and you've done really well which i'm sure everyone does and you, you might be disappointed that they don't have a job for you because you don't meet certain requirements and that's why I think it's very important to get into the system. If you're sure you want to come to the UK, then you get into the system, like we're saying, as soon as possible and try getting into a training post as soon as possible. Yeah, um, yeah I think uh, in the portfolio, other than this, the things you mentioned about leadership, degrees, uh, audit projects, uh, quality improvement projects, 
we also have things which are more uh, specific to kind of your specialties as well. Yeah. So, yeah. but the thing to know is that those things don't carry as many points as yeah. the other parts. So, so these general things which are uh, about audit projects, about uh, obviously the degrees is only what you've done till now. Obviously, that's limited by that. Uh, and there are a lot of people who don't do advanced degrees, masters or PhDs. Uh, certain specialties are very competitive and most people do it for those but like neurosurgery a lot of people have PhDs uh, but other specialties you have surgical trainees who a lot of people don't have master's degrees or PhDs uh, people going to surgical training and then you have gynae, GP, all these other things as well so they have a different uh, kind of requirements sometimes as well in terms of the exams. So I, I think now that you've touched on different fields um, so what as a as a, someone who's coming to the uk i think it's important for us to tell you what options you have available um so obviously you have your normal your run-of-the-mill options like medicine surgery i'm not going to go into the specific fields you have ophthalmology OBGYN, varying each specialty is competitive depending on which the type of specialty that you want to do one of the really commonly done specialties is a gp trainee um and i think a lot of us probably we, we we don't really consider it coming from Pakistan initially, but they have a wonderful work life balance it's you're constantly following up your patients um, it's a it's a it's genuinely something that I think people should consider if their plan if they're not too sold on hospital medicine and yeah. don't like uh, don't like staying in the hospital all the time they want to be able to spend more time with their family and you get prayed pretty well as a GP as well. So there's no real, I don't think there's many um, uh, cons to being a GP, except obviously the fact that you're not a specialist in certain fields, but some people are okay with that. And I think it's a viable field. Yeah, uh, GP definitely. It's the, as opposed to like, you'd say that uh, uh, primary care in Pakistan, obviously you look at it, it's not the best system. Uh, mm -hmm. The UK obviously has, it's been, it's developed over many, many years and they've developed the system of GP. So you're not essentially managing your private patients like that. No. You're managing communities. So these could be 40,000 yeah. people you're managing uh, entirely by yourself. Uh, they don't, it might be they're not coming to see you, but you're still managing them yeah. Yeah. Uh, and doing things so, for them. In so the like when they, when they get discharged from the hospital, the hospital will send the GP their new medications and the GP's responsibility is then to make sure they're on their new medication, yeah. things like that. So like making sure the GPs are like the glue that sticks everything together. Without GPs, yeah. the, the NHS system would collapse. Completely agree. It's very, and, very uh, vital yeah. part of and, the system. And uh, when you mentioned things like uh, specialists, so there, but however, in GP, you can choose to specialize yeah. in certain yeah. areas at the same time. Uh, some GPs do minor ops like skin tag uh, removals or uh, cryotherapy. So they still do some minor ops. They'll do things. Some might be specialists in women's health. Some might be specialists in uh, endocrinology. So you can, you can uh, vary it up, you know, have some fun. Yeah. So I think um, we've gone through most of the things that you need. Obviously, um, it's one of those things that, again, this is a session trying to basically outline how training works. And I, I'm hoping that most of the people understand that there's foundation training, core training, and then specialist training. These are all different steps to your training. And the, there's different applications at the end of the, at the start of each training that you have to apply to. Um, I think we've tried going through the number of uh, the different types of options you have available, options that are different. Uh, we've talked about eligibility criteria. We've talked about your portfolios and interviews. So I think mm -hmm. if there's any other questions that Manzer or Salman want to ask us, Abhi, about um, um, anything um, that we missed I, I think, uh, on yeah, this the, part. Tala, do you think we should talk about pros and cons a bit? Or I, like thought, I thought we could, um, I thought we'd try sticking to the, um, like the objective application stuff. So if there's anything okay. about applications that anyone wants to ask us right now, and yeah. then we can okay. then move on to pros and cons. Is that yeah, it? There was, a, uh, there was a question on the grades of your MBPS in getting the residency in UK. So okay. The grades are important. So yes. The, so, so, um, so getting training in the UK, yes. Your, the, 
your exact rank in university. So like if you're six and someone else is five, that's not going to make a difference. But if you're ranked six and someone's ranked 15, then there will be a one point difference between your applications. So um, yes, your, your, how you rank in university does make a difference. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Or could you, is there anything else that you think that we haven't touched on in terms of the questions? So, uh, can you please mention about the FCPS and FLAB options? Like, what is the difference between FCPS pathway okay. and the FLAB pathway? So, uh, FCP, yeah, yeah Ali, yeah. you go into it. You're if you don't to... mind. Uh, yeah. uh, so, for the, the FLAB, is probably the simpler route. It's the route yeah. we took. Uh, I guess from familiarity, we can say that uh, does come some bias as well. I, I, but I genuinely, I think looking at it objectively as well, uh, other routes uh, in terms of would be either you give the PLAB, then the other option is you do your complete MRCP or your MRCS, which involves giving part one and part two, which is the OSCEs. The OSCEs are a bit difficult yeah uh, compared to uh, well i wouldn't i wouldn't be attempting it after my f1 definitely not i would get experience so um, yeah uh, so and, adding uh, on to that, then the yeah. third option the third option is you do your uh, fcps and fcps means not fcps part one means complete fcps yeah. which means by that time you're already a consultant yeah and i think this adds into the point that i mentioned earlier that you, like I said, the FCPS is an extremely difficult exam. You've done really well to pass it. And you're probably at that point, a very, very qualified person, but you might, because you've not been in the UK system for that long, you might not, again, there are red herrings. So you'll hear someone who's done the FCPS come here, done training, got a job, but I don't think that's a reliable way of going about it. Um, the MRCP, like Ali said, and MRCS, they both have clinical components. And a huge part of that clinical component is working in the UK, developing your clinical skills in line with what they expect over here. And mm -hmm. I think your chances mm -hmm. of success are, ex I'm not saying that you can't pass. I'm, uh, people in Pakistan are extremely competent in terms of their clinical experience, but maybe it's not developing it in the way they expect over here. And so if you want to increase your chances of doing well on the exams, then I think starting off here and doing your exams here, once you've started work as well. So you can do the, you can do the written parts of the exam, but um, I wouldn't say trying to do all your exams before. I, and the PLAB again is a much easier option. It's a cheaper option. There's less chances of failure. It's, and you're still going to get the job and then you can take your MRCP and stuff later or yeah. MRCS later. Um, I think I'd, I'd add that uh, if you're doing the, if, if you are kind of doing the MRCP or the MRCS after getting experience, uh, if you're doing things like applying after you start residency, even in Pakistan, um, uh, that, that if you've started residency in Pakistan and then you're applying, that automatically disqualifies you from applying to core surgical training and yeah. the initial yeah. specialty training because yeah. you have experience. Yeah. And uh, what the, the really big downside of that is you have to, you have to, have to you're forced to go into a non-training job training and job, that yeah. could potentially, you could be stuck there for a few years. Yeah. That, at that stage is where some politics come into the play. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you don't so, want to yeah. get stuck in that situation. Yeah. So like Ali said, so essentially you can do your entire MRCP outside of the UK, come to the UK and then you'll have, you can't apply for core training jobs. Once you've completed your MRCP or MRCS, you have to apply for specialty training jobs after that. Uh, so it's uh, important to clarify the M um, giving the MRCP and MRCS does not disqualify you. It's having worked as a tra as, specialty yeah. training yeah. that will disqualify you from applying. Of more than 18 months of training in a specific specialty disqualifies you from uh, applying for core surgical training in that job. Yeah. yeah. And what that basically, what they're trying to do with that is trying to allow people who don't have as much experience to, it's trying to create a level playing field, right? So if someone's a consultant here and then applies for core surgical training and he wows people with his clinical, his surgical skills, that's not really fair comparing him to someone who's just done F1 and F2, right? So they're trying to make sure that there's a level playing field. And 
keep in mind, the later on you apply for training and jobs, the, like Ali said, the more politics get involved, the more difficult it is to get out of the trust grade or tra non-training job into a training job. So again, I don't, from most of the people that I've talked to and the most of the people I've seen, they've all either started off as F2s or core trainees and moved on from there. Okay. Okay. And, uh, is it necessary to have a clinical experience in the UK before applying for residency, like having some electives there? No. Or so the one thing I'm gonna try to uh, just, sorry, I hope you don't mind, but uh, the, if you're talking about the UK training, try to use the correct terminology. So get uh, stop using the word residency, stop using the word internship, I think, uh, especially when you're communicating with these people in the UK. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not so when not you're us, applying I mean, jobs, like if you're applying for jobs, care, yeah. because uh, uh, you're, uh, it shows that you've invested some time into looking at it at least. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, so in that way, because uh, we, so we understand the lingo, yeah. but they might not understand it really because yeah, yeah. a residency application over here might be applying for permanent citizenship. So that's why I think it's one of those things that if you're, if you are, again, if you are applying to people, if you're talking to people, I think another very simple thing that uh, surgeons like to be called here is they're not doctors anymore, they're misters. So if you call yeah. a surgeon a doctor, he's going to be like, what are you saying? they find they actually take it they take offense to it so yeah. surgeons uh, are not doctors so when you even when you email them it's mister yeah. and when you refer to them it's mister as well so these are very small annoying things but it's something that like once you work here you realize and it takes a while for us to get used to saying mister mister but after that it's okay sorry well, the question yeah well, you like, don't need clinical experience. Having, uh, clinical experience. Okay. no there's, there's no need um electives in the UK, again, I think the applicants, the application process is different. You don't, the LOR itself has no value. It's just like, so doing the electives itself makes no difference for your own pleasure, like for your own fun, if you want to come and see what the system is like before you work here, by all means. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, if, for yeah. example, like if you want to even, for example, trying to get coming here and maybe getting started on audits and things like that, I, that could be a possibility. However, I, it makes no, I don't think it makes any difference at all. Yeah, so yeah. Even, in, even in your specialty applications, when they ask you if you've done electives, it's not uh, in the UK. They don't specify in the UK. So it's just special uh, electives so, in uh, surgery. So people in, the UK, people in the UK go to far off places to do their electives. Um, and it's basically a way for them to see how the medical system in other places work. So I, I don't think they really take it as like a, as much of a training opportunity as we do. Anything else? So uh, the next question, yeah, the next question is, uh, does completing a house job before applying into uh, FY2 increase your chances of success rather than uh, going into f uh, foundation year one? So um, again, for applying for the F2 jobs, you have to have done your house job, right? So it's, it's a requirement. So it's not going to improve your chances. You can't apply without your house job. It's as simple as that. Whereas for F1, you can't do your right. house job. So the F1 itself, you can't be an F1 and have done your house job. They won't let you apply for the F1 then. So uh, again, it's a base requirement for your F2. Both of the training programs are similar. I think Ali and I found it, I think coming straight in as an F1, makes it a little easier because they take it a little easier on you and they let you understand the system. So you're basically um, very junior. So they, they ease you into the system. Whereas in F2, when you start straight away, you're expected to be a relative, not a senior member of the team, but a responsible independent member of a team who can independently practice a certain amount of medicine in a safe way. Um, and so that becomes a little more daunting, especially when you don't under understand the system as much. Um, again, one of the really important things when you're talking about, again, I, I should have added this earlier, is practicing safe medicine. No one expects anyone to have the answers for every question. If they give you a scenario in any interview for any job with a severely sick patient, your number one response should be, I will let my seniors know. 
because if that patient decompensates or dies or anything happens, if you tried handling it on your own, there's no way they're letting you through the job. You have to prove that you're a safe practitioner of medicine or surgery or whatever. You're your safe doctor, basically. Yeah, um, and I'd add that uh, in the interview, they always ask you at the level that you are applying from, yeah. not for the level that you are applying to. So yeah. it's never going to be more advanced than you're expected to know at that exactly. stage. Exactly. They're very straightforward and they're very understand. To be fair, the applications are very straightforward understanding of the stage if you are at the, of the stage that you are in right now. Yeah. So they're, I, I'm, I, I thought they were very reasonable. Um, any other questions? Yeah, to go forward. Yeah, so what is the chances that... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, do we need a PMDC certification if we're skipping our house job? And going to FY1. So if you're going for FY1, you need you still need a provisional GMC registration, and for that you do need provisional PMDC registration as well as a certificate of good standing for your from PMDC. I think so, the way the way to put it is you need the certificate of good standing. Yeah. But the PMDC doesn't give it to you unless you have a provisional registration. Exactly. Uh, the fine details of it, according to their own. Uh, what they've written down is a bit, uh, I don't agree with, but um, I, I have to follow them, don't I? So that is what it is. So yeah, you do need it. You, you do need, essentially the answer, a simple answer is yes. And again, for the certificate of good, good standing, it's only valid for three months. So you really, really have to be very good with your time management when it comes to applications. Anything else from the application portion? Right. Uh, okay, so what are the chances uh, someone does their foundation year training and does not get into uh, core training? Um, depending on the specialty that you apply to, um, this year, they've, uh, surgical training has become very competitive. Um, so there is a chance but it's not a chance it's not basically one of those dead ends that you've applied and then you can't do it again or that there's no hope for you or whatever the competitive competitiveness of applications varies year by year and essentially there is a chance people do get rejected so i don't and this year i've known quite a few people who haven't gotten core surgical training interviews or jobs so that's i think that's one of the things that we wanted to explain to people as well that I know it's competitive in the US, but it is quite competitive over here, especially for difficult specialties and difficult training programs. So don't think of it as an easy way out. You'll still have to put in hard work and still have to do, uh, make your portfolio uh, good enough to apply. So I think Ali, is there anything else that you want to add on to that? Um, yeah, so I think in terms of the numbers, uh, I can speak a little bit. Um, yeah, go ahead. I think for, at least for surgical training, surgical training has about five, had 550 posts this year. Uh, and they interviewed about 1500 people for those posts. Yeah. And that does not count how many people applied for those Live. interviews. So that'll be about 4,000 people applying, 5,000 people applying for about 550 posts. So, And that's primarily and, also because they've opened round one to foreign applicants as well. Yeah. So now everyone can apply, apply for the first for core training even if you're in pakistan you can apply straight away that's not to say that you're going to get the job or get the interviews because you have to then yeah. obviously so, also you have to get your competencies signed off as well so that's one of the things um, what that basically means is that uh, people who are uh, local uk graduates have no yeah. advantage over yeah. people who come from abroad do trust grade jobs exactly so all of you have are at a and level playing chance. field if you Provided are provided your application is good enough yeah, um, I think I can speak right, for medicine. Yeah. I think medicine had uh, around four, four and a half for 5,000 applications this time. Um, the total number of medicine jobs is far more in the UK because they need, I think the number of medics overall is higher. So it goes up, I think they had around 1900 jobs. Um, but again, because you're, because they've increased the number, because you're, so many people are allowed to apply 
um, that obviously does make it a little more competitive from this year onwards. Having said that, I don't think there's anything that's completely undoable. I think you can easily, I think people can easily manage, uh, manage to get jobs, but with provided putting in hard work. Okay, so Dr. Tala, if you had to uh, rank the importance of uh, something in your application process, then how would you rank it? Like, for example, research, LORs, anything like okay. that? Yeah, I think that's a good question. It's a very good question, actually. So in terms of ranking, I would say, um, so things like research, poster presentation, audits, quips. Um, so quips means quality improvement projects. All have very similar number of points. An additional degree would be even better. You get more points. I don't know if everyone has the time or is, is able to do that. I, that's up to them. I don't have one. Um, I would love to, I think I will eventually pursue one because I think it's a good, something that everyone should consider, but it's up to you. Um, your ranking in terms of your, at least for both my applications, your actual decile ranking makes it, makes a pretty significant, well, one point difference, but if someone's in the first decile and someone's in the ninth, then that makes a difference. Right. Okay. Um, and then in terms of your ranking, for the jobs, your interview makes a huge difference. So provided you get to the, you're eligible for an interview. So again, your application is first judged objectively, and then you come to the interview where you have, where you have your chance to impress. So provided you get the interview, then that's, if your application, like I didn't feel my application is very strong, that's your chance to then shine, right? Then, and that way you can mention. So like, even in your application, they ask you for commitment to specialty, et cetera. That doesn't give you any extra points. But when it comes to the interview, if you said, you know what, I want to, I want to do surgery for the longest time. I've been involved with this, 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 this. I've shown, and you have an application to be well, this guy's actually quite interested. Um, people, I think, really focus on objective things as well. So like doing your MRCP just gives you one point. Uh, at least for our application, gave yeah, us one the, point. The, the benefit is not worth. It, it's not worth the, the effort. So I wouldn't, I would, I would focus on doing more extracurricular things and trying to get those things sorted and basically tick as many points as possible, but it's usually one or two points per thing. So you can do 15 research papers, but you're only going to get two points. Or maybe I think as you go further on in training, the number of research articles and peer reviewed journals can affect the number of points. So in my current application, when I applied those things, you can get more points depending on the number of articles and how many peer reviewed articles you've published, et cetera. Um, but having said, so like there's a grade, but there's a difference between national and international poster presentations, um, national and international audit presentations, et cetera. So, but again, the overall thing is maybe a few points in each category. All of these things are available online. So if you want specifics, I would always say, go to the website, have a look, and it's very clearly stated that this is what you need to do. So they'll tell you what the base requirements are. Right. Does that answer the question? I hope. Yes, I think it does. Yeah. Okay. So I think that now we can move on to general questions about the experience of a person in the UK. Okay. Is yeah. I think that's okay? fair. Yeah. I think that's good. Yeah. Okay. Manzer, go ahead. Okay, so uh, please tell, me, uh, tell us about the working hours and of the, uh, what do you say residency? <laughs> Sorry, I forgot. The training and uh, how to maintain a good uh, work-life work balance. balance. Yeah, yeah, fine. Okay, so Ali, do you want to get started and then I can yeah, add yeah. on? Yeah, yeah, you get started. Uh, too. So um, in the UK, our, uh, well, while it was part of the EU, um, there was something called the European Working Time Directive. What this means was that under no circumstances could you work more than 14 hours in a row. In circumstances you were asked to work more than 14 hours in a row, you would have to have a five hour sleep after those 14 hours uh, before you'd be allowed to work anymore. So uh, generally there is no shift on any NHS roster that is more than 12 and a half hours. Yes. Uh, and after that you go home, you come back, 
for another 12 and a half hour shift, you might do four of these shifts in a row. In a row. Uh, yeah. In most hospitals, at least in mine, they have a rule that in a week you can't work more, or you can't work, uh, if you're working consecutive days, you can't work more than 78 hours together in consecutive days. So yeah. after, after that, before that happened, uh, before you breach that, uh, and that's not the Europe. That's not part of the European Working Time Directive. So that is an NHS kind of a yeah. policy. That seventy-eight hour thing. So you do get a good amount of time uh, yeah. to yourself, whether you're recovering from working or oh, whether yeah. you want to spend some time doing something else. Yeah. Um, and if you have these kind of shifts where you're doing on calls on the day or during the night, you do get uh, a few days off. Always after that, you get at least two to four days off. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, you get a uh, good amount of time. Other than that, uh, you you uh, I mean, and so you get a good, good amount of time to do things you want to do. Uh, whether that's you want to spend that time uh, developing your portfolio, whether you want to spend that time reading up just with family, reading, going on trips, uh, enjoying yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So I think like I think uh, adding on to Ali's. Ali's point. So like in a, in most hospitals, your normal working day will either be, it depends on whether it's surgery, medicine, surgery is eight to five. And in my hospital, medicine is nine to five in my hospital. Uh, currently in Cambridge, in Cambridge last year, my hours are a little longer. So um, I had my normal working day for medicine was 8.30 to six on in surgery it was 7.30 to 5.30. No one's expecting you to come early um, I usually go to work around 15, 20 minutes early just to get myself ready for the day. But you don't have to come and do an entire round and know the patients. You're expected to do the round with the consultant anyways. Yeah. Um, like Ali said, Ali was talking about on-call shifts, right? So before you start on night shifts, as a junior doctors, you're only going to be expected to do 12 to 13 hour shifts max. Um, after You will be expected to do a stretch of nights. So you might do four in a row or three in a row. But you can always come back home, sleep, recover, go back for the next night. It's 12 hour shifts. And before and after nights, you get maybe a day off. Sometimes after nights, you get even more than a day off. Um, sometimes three, four days. In my last hospital, I used to get a week off to recover. And then, but again, this varies depending on the hospital. So some hospitals are great. Some hospitals, not so much. Depends on how many, how, how much they need you. Um, so, uh, you do get enough downtime. Um, you, again, in terms of taking annual leave, we get nine. Uh, we, get, uh, tw we get a month's worth of uh, 28 days of annual leave yeah. per year. And but um, being and in I, training programs, you have to divide it per rotation. So it's per, nine yeah. working days yeah. per rotation and you have three rotations. So a total of 27 working days. Yeah, now I you can be very you. smart with that and try making yourself get a couple of weekends, maybe do a few swaps and you can get two weeks off easily to come back to Pakistan. And I think coming from England, you spend a seven hour flight, you come straight back home to Pakistan and you're sort, you're, you, there's no jet lag or anything like that. You're back into, it's, it's, it's great. Yeah. So you do have, it's really good in terms of work-life balance. Um, I don't, I didn't spend very, a lot of time, um, bettering myself in my time off so like video games and going out and all of these things are accessible things for you to do as normal yeah. human beings who need i yeah. work can get stressful so <laughs> very very stressful at times so it is important to make use of your downtime yeah yeah i think uh, uh, <clears throat> and yeah go ahead Go for it. And Go there for it, are there any safety issues like uh, especially for women who are working alone, yeah, living there in UK? So uh, I think so. I don't really. I think it varies depending on where you live. Number one, because I think the experience you'll get in the UK varies significantly in where you live. There are obviously a few common things regardless of where I'm living. Even if I'm living the world's safest place. I would be careful with. Um, I think big cities like London, Birmingham, Manchester, all of these places being metropolitan, big cities have similar areas that you should avoid, similar areas that similar times of the day that you should avoid. Now, if you're a girl walking in the middle of the night after an, or coming after a night shift or going to a night shift at 9, 10 p.m., going to a hospital that you know you're going to cross through a bad area, 
just take a taxi you know like but otherwise i've not personally my wife works over here she goes for her night shift she uses public transport actually i have not experienced any kind of safety concerns obviously there are things there are going to be it happens all over the world but i think all of us coming from karachi i'm sure the people from other parts of pakistan as well i don't think there's anything for us to worry about particularly just be careful like i would give this advice regardless of where you go yeah i think uh, i agree with everything uh, be careful and uh, something bad could happen anywhere to be fair yeah, exactly um, I think whether you're in pakistan uk so where ali's living right now is a very nice safe place uh, um, yeah yeah it's very safe uh, yeah. but i think uh, what i've seen from my colleagues is some of them still take taxis home yeah, while yeah. i'll just walk at I night think, but that's where, personal where, preference where i'm living right now has some dodgy bits so i don't usually i usually drive to and from work but again literally nothing has ever been said to me no one's ever had a go at me or no one's ever tried stealing anything and last year when i was living in cambridge uh, cambridge i used to go to i used to go out to the house at 12 am 1 am and like literally there would be log yahan pe they sleep very early so the roads are empty basically there's nothing there's it, obviously uh, i don't think there's many people around at that time anyways so just be careful okay and are there any uh, the have you faced any kind of racism or like act of biases in your experience so uh, acts mm. of biases are severely limited because of the national application thing so they can't be biased in the application themselves in itself there's no way of them being objectively biased towards you it's all through points right racism again the areas that we keep in mind england is far has so many desis in it that they're used to seeing us around right so a very very multinational very very uh, country yeah. very exactly some areas obviously more white than others it's like anywhere in the world so maybe like in certain small villages or certain small towns there fewer desis around so they they might be a little confused but i have not once in two years experienced any kind of racism that's not to say that there isn't racism i'm sure in some pockets there might be so i don't want to create this rosy picture but i haven't experienced anything and i don't think there's any bias based on skin color really but i think uh, you'll see that uh, as as he was saying like with the safety issue as well in larger cities yeah. you will tend to see or in areas which are more working class in terms of yeah. Yeah. ports factories things like that yeah. you see people who are maybe have those tendencies a little more ignorant um, i'd say yeah they're ignorant i wouldn't say they uh, go out of the way to be racism or things yeah. like that a lot no. of the times it's just ignorance and keep and, in uh, mind you see you see that ignorance even in people who are more affluent though i will say yeah. uh, from my own experience it's not something that they try to be racist or are yeah. hating you yeah. it comes off uh, in an ignorant way uh, you can and brush it off And having said that as a, as a uh, as a yeah. as a doctor if someone is racist to you while you work no one's expecting you to continue treating that patient yeah. if someone is racist to me i'd say thank you very much i'm done i'll call a colleague to come and see you i cannot yeah. continue this it's a simple uh, as if, that if 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 they're really bad they'll kick them out of the hospital yeah, yeah. So there's no uh, there's absolutely no tolerance for anything no tolerance. like that um secondly i think in the application process you're speaking about uh well in there's no in uh, racism or anything like that but i think in terms of surgical training you find i think uh sometimes uh, women are disadvantaged uh I, but it's not it's not hugely or anything i've spoken to people about this generally about any disadvantages that exist and things like that um i think it's generally to do with uh, the culture of surgical training as well it's very male dominated uh yeah. saying that i will say that all the surgical departments at my hospital have at least like yeah, they're not gonna, male they're, they're still male dominated but they have female consultants gonna, who are lead the female yeah. consultant for orthopedics is the lead the urologist is the lead is she's a woman yeah. so uh, i'm, I'm not fact, saying that you the urology have, uh, consultant in my hospital the, the clinical lead for urology in my hospital is a, a lady from india a doctor from india who wears shalwar kurta to do her rounds and no one back like there's no there's no uh, no one even thinks twice before asking her what she's wearing in yeah. fact people are like wow you look amazing so yeah. and i think out in my in my hospital's general surgery department there are total of four trainees 
and two staff grade doctors, the three out of the four trainees are actually women. So I think, it, again, I think in, it obviously your experience varies from field to field. Um, but I, I can speak from a medicine perspective that I think there's so many women medical doctors that I, I don't think there's any particular. In fact, I think just because women tend to be a little smarter, they probably get better jobs. So. All right. So uh, another question that we've been asked a lot is, uh, can you please elaborate on the financial aspect of things? So like starting from the cost of applying for your plabs and all those and all the application process and then moving on to the salary that you get as a trainee and then further on uh, as you move later on in life then as a consultant and so on. Okay. Yeah. Fine. So, so let's start off with the costs. I think the plab one costs, like you said, 200, 300 pounds. Um, Obviously, ticket prices and things like that vary, so I'm not going to add those into it. Um, okay. These applications themselves, again, for applying for PLAB 1, for doing your PLAB 1 and PLAB 2 in the UK, sorry, you have to apply for a normal visa. I don't know what the application, for the price of that is, but it can't be too much. Uh, PLAB 2 costs £865, last I checked. Um, and then applying for the course during our time was 500 pounds that you'd pay and then you'd be sorted for the course, uh, the course itself. After accommodation, ka, my advice would be again, if you have anyone that you know, take a course near them and then try living with them, simple, and save costs that way. Otherwise, depending on where you're doing the course, the rent can vary. So uh, my wife, when she was doing the course in the UK, because she didn't have any relatives here, she was living in London, close to the course, and that costed her around 800 pounds not advisable again but again these are things obviously you can avoid all of these costs by being smart and trying to cut costs where you can and living in different so living in certain places london is by far the most expensive place in the uk Num that's number one so anyone who has aspirations of working in the uk if they want to work in london they have to understand that they're going to get absolutely destroyed by rent and everything like that Ticket. So uh, that's your application, but IELTS, ka, I don't remember the cost specifically. Ali, do you uh, remember? It's, uh, it was, uh, when we gave it, it was uh, in rupees, it was about 20,000. 20,000 rupees. Ticket. So you add all of these costs together. It's not, it's, it is, it's not a cheap application, but it isn't, obviously, uh, it's not, I think there are other applications that are more expensive. Um, so these are the bits that the NHS won't refund for you, right? Now, let's say you applied for a job, you've got your registration, you've applied for a job, and now they've given, they've, uh, they've you said that you've got the job. Now, what, what else can you, what, what will they do? So they'll send you the certificate of sponsorship. Um, depending on which job you're getting and what the perks are, some will give you, say that we'll cover your visa costs and we'll let you come, we'll pay for you to, we'll uh, basically cover your visa costs and you basically just pay for the ticket and we'll cover your moving like relocation fees, so like things like extra luggage, et cetera. I'm sure they, they, it varies depending on the application. So a friend of mine who applied last year, they've paid for his entire visa costs, right? So I think that for him and his wife, both that's around uh, 2,000 pounds in total that they've paid you back. Again, you initially have to pay out, your, out of your own pocket or they might actually give you the money to apply. But I think more often than not, you have to pay out of your own pocket and then they refund you as soon as you come here, right? Um, the visa application itself for a tier two visa, once you get sponsored, is 80,000 per person for the visa. There's an, Alag say there's an expedited fee, but Jerry's in Pakistan does not do an expedited thing. So I don't think it's advisable. So you can pay the fee, but fayda nahi yoga simply. Um, and then, the second thing is paying for the health surcharge, which is basically you being able to come to the UK and using the NHS for your healthcare. Um, up until recently, it was 600 pounds per person uh, per year. Um, and if you're coming with a dependent, then you have to show that you're, you've got enough money if you have to pay for all three years so if of your job contract at the time or however long it is that yeah. you'll be in the UK for that period. Um, so the person I was talking to said in total, it costed them because him and his wife were both applying for jobs. So it costed them 160,000 per person for the health surcharge. And then that was it. Um, after that, they, they are now being refunded 800 pounds each. 
um, as per their initial visa application process, et cetera. The health surcharge, you still have to pay because that's basically you paying for your health care. It's as simple as that. But the visa application, they do return to you. Uh, the health surcharge also... Uh, Has been so waived, I think, now. So at, at the moment, it's in Parliament. Uh, they're okay. trying... Uh, there's a lot of pressure on the government to get it completely taken, taken off. NHS but, just, but just for people who are working in the NHS. So you, yeah. you need to pay for your dependents at, yeah. at the same time. So like, if you're right now... Because um, if you I if you come if you come uh, with uh, maybe your family you you, yeah, so if you uh, come with your wife you spouse especially. and a child uh, you and your uh, spouse and child are not in the NHS uh, obviously child yeah. not working uh, yeah. uh, then uh, you have to pay for them <laughs> yeah, yeah unless you have a very professional <laughs> child who's working in the NHS and you're seventy years old but yeah. <laughs> And what about uh, fi the finances of uh, training and so on? Okay, so I think that's one of the... So while you're training, uh, as a trainee, um, I do, again, I think your salary can vary depending on the kind of rotations you have. Not massively, though, and the uh, amount of extra hours you do. So, so while you're a trainee, when you're doing your GP placement, so not when you're in GP training itself, but when you're in your GP placement of training of your foundation year one and two, your salary dips because you're not doing as many extra hours. I think you get paid on average close to, for FY1, I would say between 35 and 40,000 pounds a year. Um, for FY2, around 45,000 pounds a year. For F2, for CMT onwards, and your salary goes up each year. So CMT onwards, it's around... 50, 52, uh, reg training will go up to, up, up until reg training, you'll do 65. Now, one of the things that Ali mentioned and one of the things that you guys mentioned was um, work-life balance, right? Now, obviously, you're contractually there. Uh, they have to pass certain regulations with your rota to allow you enough time off. Now, let's say you're a workaholic who just wants to work and wants to make extra money, right? Certain hospitals will have certain vacancies depending on where you work and you can take up those extra shifts. Usually they're on call shifts. You get paid per hour on those shifts. So if you're doing a 12 hour shift as an SHO, as an FY2 in my hospital, you get paid close to 50 pounds an hour. So that means in one shift, you'll make 600 pounds or close to. Okay. Right? So these are all ways to supplement your salary all the way to a consultant. Um, um, GP, that's before tax. That's all before tax. Yeah, tax over here. I don't want to get into tax over here because there is a significant yeah. chunk of your salary that can get cut into tax, um, like other places, and probably more so than other places. Um, the salary itself, to be fair, I, 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 my wife and I both work here. Um, Ali's been here alone. I don't think at any point that I felt that I've not got enough money to do something that I want yeah. to do. Like, obviously, I'm not saying that you go to central London and buy a Ferrari. No, you can't do that as a trainee. That's never going to happen unless you've got some other business, right? But having yeah. said that, reasonable thing you should be able to enjoy. Extravagance, like people still, you should still be able to afford to go on vacations. In fact, going on vacations from the UK to the rest of Europe is cheap anyways. So you're, you're, yeah. you're enjoying yourself with that. Um, yeah. But Yes, tax can be annoying. Um, but having said that, at least your tax over here is paying for people to get treated where you're working. So, um, you know, it, the tax is going somewhere. Uh, I think uh, what I'll just talk about the figures Talha mentioned. So uh, if you look on the websites, uh, the salaries are actually just stated uh, uh, for F1, it's around 27,000. So what Talha is stating is obviously in, uh, so 27,000 is your base salary. What you get and then everything is, that's 95, that's your 40 hours a week. But yeah. usually you're working more than that more a week. So those are supplemented. So you get up yeah. to 35,000 through that. And that's why I said um, that it varies depending on your field. Um, again, it varies depending on how many extra shifts you do. If you want to work locums, that's a, there's a big thing in the UK of doing locums. Um, again, ideally people, you should, you should have a good enough balance to be able to take enough time off, enjoy yourself. And if you want to make extra money, make extra money, do whatever you want to do. But, um, obviously don't let it detriment your actual training health. and your applications. Yeah. Or your health. Yeah. Um, 
we can get, uh, I think once you become a consultant, you again, so initially you're all, we're all expected to work in the NHS. So you get close to, I would say around about a hundred thousand pounds a year. Um, that's the consensus that I can tell. I think depending on which, yeah. uh, which field you do, doesn't really make that much of a difference to your salary. So you, if someone you, start, plans, you start around 80,000 and yeah, with and seniority, you up, it increases. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, all of the, again, I think the one thing that people need to understand is initially, yes, it, your consultant salary might take a while to build up. Building your name as a private practitioner, there is still private practice in the UK. Um, depending on where you live, you'll have certain opportunities available. Um, you can supplement your income. Um, you can do extra things. You can, for example, if you if there are more again consultants similarly have more on calls to cover etc so you could offer to cover more on call shifts you could supplement your salary that way etc so there are there are ways to make money if you want to make money um again i'm not going to say that it's going to be as high as the us um but i will also not say that it's at the point where you're going to be living a mediocre life i think you can definitely live a good life in the uk with the salary that you make as a doctor. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, the next question that we got uh, quite a lot was that the the fact that in 2022 the UK MLA is going to be implemented. So we wanted to know about that and how it's going to change things and everything. So I think Ali, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. 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 Uh, so UK MLA is uh, going to be from 2023. Yeah. 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 That's correct. Uh, so it's going to replace the plab. Um, what I've, uh, what I know is what's available on the website. I unfortunately don't know more than that, but I'll tell you that at least. Um, so it's uh, basically going to be similarly structured to the plab. Uh, There's going to be a written section and a OSCE part. Uh, the written part will include uh, clinical, uh, clinical section with clinical questions, clinical judgment questions, and a section which will be an ethics kind of section, section where you uh, get various ethical, uh, moral uh, management type scenarios where you have to uh, uh, rank choices or make decisions based on that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, and uh, the OSCE will be similar to the current lab style OSCE. Uh, the part one will have, uh, uh, they've said that it'll be available internationally and you'll be able to give, they'll be doing four dates internationally, uh, similar to I think how the lab one is run at the moment. And yeah. uh, the OSCE part will still be, the only center will be Manchester. And I think the difference um, with this is that it's uh, local grads over here will have to do it as well. So everyone will be on a yes. level playing field. Yeah. And in uh, addition to that, so you, if I think most people are also worried about transitioning period. So what they've said for that is if you haven't given any of the PLAB exams, you'll have to give the UK MLA. If you've given PLAB 1, you'll be automatically qualified for part 2 of the UK MLA. If you've... Uh, done lab one and two i'm sure initially they'll have some leniency and uh, they'll allow you to get gmc registered according to that yeah again i think keep in mind that they're very reasonable over here so they're not going to be unnecessarily just cut out your applications because yeah, you, they won't be difficult that, about uh, it the, no they and won't. even even and and uh, they're quite accommodating in the sense that even if they sometimes close things uh, or say this is not allowed officially on the written if you ask them in a sometimes somebody some, sometimes they're, they're nice enough to say okay we'll let you in or, or yeah. we'll let, we'll do but having said that uh having said that I don't please, expect that please please adhere to guidelines in terms yeah. of the times yeah. for yeah. applications because yeah. it is very likely that even if you if you send in your application a minute later then the application portal is open for your application will not be considered so please oh, yeah. don't be very very particular about uh, guidelines in terms of timings, etc. Yeah, they're, they're very particular about timing. Yeah, yeah. That, um, they won't budge on that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think, like Ali said, it's basically it's gonna what it's gonna probably do is probably create a more level playing field for foreign graduates as well. So it'll give you, if everyone has to do it, at least it'll show what that we're off an equal standard, if not better, hopefully. So. 
<clears throat> okay so there are some surgery related questions specifically uh, which uh, a lot of people have asked the path mm -hmm. to become a special surgeon like cardiothoracic surgeon or orthopedic surgeon or plastic to... plastic surgeon so uh, mm -hmm. how to go about that yeah like what is the pro exact process of becoming a well, we're going to divide the divide the groups into medicine and surgery because i think then we can go into you can go into the uh, no, they're not the, uh, that much questions, so no, maybe in the main room. Okay, fine. Okay. They're just few one and two questions. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, so for your uh, specialty surgical training, I think uh, when you're looking at things, uh, generally you have your foundation, your core surgical training every two years, um, and after that you have ST three to uh, eight, uh, three to eight, usually which is six years long. Um, when you're applying to things like cardiothoracic, uh, I think uh, they, for some for some specialties, they actually have uh, run through programs. Um, so this includes neurosurgery, this includes cardiothoracics, this includes ophthalmology, general surgery, urology, vascular surgery, and orthopedics. Uh, if, uh, uh, and orthopedics, uh, orthopedics uh, started this year, uh, but uh, so in certain certain specialties have run through. Neurosurgery only has run through. Uh, it's a lot more competitive, um, and uh, what essentially that means, uh, and any of these surgical specialties will always be competitive if you're applying for run through programs, particularly more because there. Um, so as I mentioned, there are 550 spots for core surgical training. Out of these orthopedic run through spots were about 20. So you can imagine it's going to be more competitive anyway. Um, so what is the difference between the run through? Uh, so, run through run, so, run, so run through essentially means uh, you don't need to apply again after you do your first two years. So you, uh, the core surgical training basically uh, gets replaced by the fact that as long uh, that you straight away go through from uh, as after your surgery, second year of surgical training onto the third year you don't need to apply again yeah so it basically it's you skip the second application yeah that uh, but i think uh, ali i think correct me if i'm wrong there are limited numbers of run through programs available oh, so yeah yeah yeah, yeah, said all, that, uh, yeah yeah so after core surgical training if you don't for any specialist training if you don't get the run through program you still have to go through core surgical training and then apply for specialist training afterwards yeah. So yeah. Uh, the number of years in both the cases will be the same. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You don't save uh, any so time. All surgical training is, uh, if you include foundation, 10 years. 10 years. Yeah. So if you if foundation is two years, uh, core surgical training is two years, and then your specialty training is six years. And is it any different for uh, like trauma surgery, which is a bit different? Uh, so when you're talking about trauma, uh, so over here in uh, the UK, they have, they, it's trauma and orthopedics is a specialty. Uh, that does not include abdominal trauma. That does not include thoracic trauma. Thoracic trauma is dealt with by cardiothoracics. Yes. Uh, abdominal trauma is dealt with general surgeons. Those would be spe uh, fellowships or specialties you would, uh, subspecializations. Um, I'm not too familiar with what how that happens, but uh, exactly. So, but what I can tell you is that uh, the UK system for trauma, particularly, is based. Uh, each deanery or location has a major trauma center, and uh, those would be the areas only where they would be actually so, sending trauma patients and doing trauma. So, so my brother's uh, a surgical uh, registrar over here, so he's quite he's he's going towards the end of his surgical training now. So I think like most specialties towards the end of your training. So let's say you're towards the last two to three years. At that point, you can then, they do give you the opportunity to then start specifying or going into certain fields. So like if you're going into upper GI or lower GI surgery, et cetera, that that's when you can start choosing those things in particular. So I think, but he's at that stage now. So he's now ST6 and he's choosing to go into upper GI. So I think in within all of that, you'll still probably have to do a fellowship after you train as well. But I think yeah. as a general surgery and an orthopedics registrar, you're part of the trauma call every time you're on call, aren't you? So 
you get a lot of exposure to trauma, abdominal bones or whatever, and cardiothoracics. I think cardiothoracics is one of the few that's in specific centers. But if anyone has any kind of thoracic trauma, then that will the patient will probably be stabilized and sent straight to one of those centers. Uh, and uh, is this possible that someone uh, do uh, two or four years of medicine and then go to surgery? So you have to apply all over again for training. There's no crossover, right? Because the kind of pathology you see, the kind of skills that you gain are completely different for medicine and surgery. So after doing two to four years of medical training, you can always get bored and no one's going to say that, you know what, don't, you're not allowed to switch. You can switch, but you'll have to start from scratch, unfortunately. Um, I'll, I'll add that uh, in surgeon specialties, uh, they allow you to carry over your competencies. So these specialties would include GP, emergency medicine, which allow you to carry over competencies from other training that you might have been in. Yeah. So you, they add to your already competencies. So you might might be able to like be a year ahead, maybe, when you start those things like that yeah so yeah but i don't think from like if someone's in medical but, training but you going into surgery yeah. i don't think that's going so to surgery it. doesn't accept that yeah. Though. yeah yeah and neither does medicine so if you're doing surgery and you're coming into medicine uh, you'll have to start from scratch same thing goes for things like anesthetics so yeah. um, you'll have to go you'll have to start from core training level again if you want to switch so let's say if, if you want to switch from medicine so that's why i think that's one of the things that i wanted to touch on which is basically don't be in a rush to get through training because the last thing you want to do, and this is one of the things that they really emphasize in the UK is I know everything seems like it's a lot of time and we did counted out the years for you as well, but all of this does add to your experience. And at the end of the day, if you're doing a field that you love because you had to do an extra year somewhere else, so be it. But as long as, you, as long as you've made the right decision so that you avoid doing two to four years somewhere else and then either continue because you can't be bothered going back to change your field yeah. or you change your field and then you've wasted a certain amount of time. I don't think, I think it's very important to pick the field based on what you enjoy. So forget about, if you, if you plan to stay in the UK, forget about the financial aspects of it because most, of, most consultants earn the same amount of money. I don't think there's any consultant that would say he makes significantly more than anyone else from the NHS. Private practice is different. Um, and I, I don't think... G and I GPs earn just about the same amount. Yeah, as GPs earn the, the same as much as specialist consultants, sometimes more. Um, so it really, really, it gives you the opportunity to objectively pick what you enjoy. Um, I'll, I'll add that... Uh, for uh, when you're actually just uh, looking at these uh, specialties uh, and stuff uh, and looking at uh, 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 taking t uh, making sure you pick the right thing. A lot of what's popular in the UK is to take do a third year after your foundation of as an SHO. So they call yeah. it an FY3. Uh, you could use that time to get uh, additional degrees, do a master's, do some locums and travel. These kind, these are kind of popular things done here. Yeah. Uh, or just gain experience in a field that you might be interested in. Exactly. Um, so, and overall, I think with the length of time of training, what you, uh, what's, uh, you develop maturity. Mm -hmm. You're very young when you go into med school. You're still very young when you're starting foundation yeah. training. You're still very young when you're doing or surgical training in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. Um, developing that maturity de develops um, you, you as a person looking at the clinical situations. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, in addition to all the actual clinical training you get, yeah. big emphasis in the UK is on developing you as a whole rounded consultant. Clinician, yeah. You're not clinician. You're not just a clinician. You're a leader. You're a manager. Yeah. You're an educator. So they yeah. really, really emphasize on developing those other skills as well. Yeah. So you're not just yeah. developing your clinical training and you don't, being a surgeon isn't just about cutting. It's about yeah, leading. Exactly. It's about yeah. managing. A lot of surgeons go into clinical management, becoming, becoming yeah. program directors, becoming uh, clinical leads, becoming uh, yeah. uh, hospital leads. So things like that. Yeah. So I think that's something that it's, I, I think is very good that Ali touched on that it's not just about doing one skill well. You have to be very good at just being a good, like a whole round leader of a team. Well, as a consultant over here, 
you're not considered just a specialist. You're considered responsible for whatever's happening on the ward. Those are your decisions that your trainees are making under your name. So you have to give your trainees, and that's one of the things I think over here, you're expected to ask questions and you're allowed to question the, the consultants and their management if you feel like you don't quite truly understand it because at the end of the day, you need to, they, need to, they have to provide you with that education and that's why I think it's really important as a, to be, get into training jobs because then they're responsible for training you. I then they're investing the their time and their energy into training you and they have to do that. Yeah. Uh, the opportunity to speak up and uh, say what you want. Yeah. There's not as much as a hierarchy there. over here. You're always yeah. allowed to speak up. Um, some might, some might be, some people might take offense to it. So be it. At the end of the day, it's your GMC registration. I've had disagreements with consultants. I've had disagreements with registrars, people far more senior than me. Um, and there's a very big emphasis in working on the UK, in the UK on bullying. So if you feel someone's got it out for you, someone's been exceptionally rude to you, you can, that's why, and they're very scared of trainees over here because trainees have a lot of power. And I can give you an example because well, this is an example my brother gave me, which is basically the urology team in one of his hospitals wasn't providing enough training opportunities to the trainees working in that hospital. The department is warned once because the trainees complained. They were warned twice. The third time, they removed all trainees from the department and said the consultants will have to go do the ward jobs themselves because they're not fit to have trainees. So there are repercussions if you feel that you're just being made to do ward jobs or, and you're not being able, you're not being stimulated enough. You can complain and you can make a difference. So these things do apply. As trainees over here, you have, a, you have lots of rights. Yeah. And they make sure, and that's what I'm trying to say, there are repercussions. So no one can say something to you and get, a, get away with it. Someone said uh, something, to, if someone yeah. said something to, it to me, I can complain to my consultant. I can complain to the medical director if I have to, if I feel that it was unjust. Uh, I think uh, one thing that people can go look up maybe afterwards is about clinical governance. Yeah, I think that's something everyone who, if anyone's everyone serious about up. coming to the UK, they should, li they should look up clinical governance itself. And it basically talks you through the process of escalating things, simple things like complaints, etc. So it's, it's, it's about everything in terms of audits, quality yeah. improvements. Uh, it covers kind of how the NHS runs. Yeah. Uh, so I think, yeah. Um, okay. any other questions? Yeah, thank you so much for covering the surgery part in detail. Uh, I'll hand over the mic to Salman Heather for more medicine questions. I think he might have some connectivity issues. No, that's, uh, okay. that's okay. Um, you can uh, you can, I, I don't make I don't think it makes a difference. You can ask uh, the medical questions, or I can have a look through yeah. the uh, the questions if you want. One second. Um, so I'll fill in for Salman, I guess, right now, and just do it. Uh, do it on my own. One sec. It's fine. Um, so medicine in particular. Okay. So, so what are the options you have? Uh, what are the options there for? Okay. No, that doesn't count. Um, so which fields are the most competitive and how difficult is it to get into it as an IMG? I think that's something that applies for both uh, medicine and surgery. So I'll just try covering it with the help of Ali. Um, medicine Getting into core medical training itself isn't extremely difficult. It's pretty doable. Again, I'm not going to say that you're going to walk through and people are going to be asking you to come in. It might not be that simple, but it's generally more, they need, there are more jobs available because they need, they need obviously more medical trainees, but they're more medical fields than surgical fields. Um, and they have more training posts available for those. So that's why it's easier to get into medical training. The competitive, Competitiveness varies for medicine, for surgery, for foundation year one, foundation year two varies depending on where you apply and which, which places you've ranked, right? So, and I, I want to really emphasize this point. So if, for example, you expect to work in central London, that's extremely competitive. If your centers like um, Oxford, Cambridge, Birmingham, big cities where people tend to want to live, 
are going to be more competitive. Um, certain sp so the real competition for medicine from that perspective comes in specialist training. So your second application. So that will basically be when you, for example, apply to cardiology, when you apply to gastroenterology, which are tend to be the two more competitive ones. And everyone, I think a lot of people want to go into that. Renal medicine is a very good field. Pulmonology is an interventional field as well now. So you can do those, you can, you can get into that. Um, I think in general, cardiology, gastroenterology are more competitive. Um, neurology, I remember there's a question that someone asked about neurology, which is basically, you still go through core med, you still go through medical training. So you do your IMT one, two, um, for, I think for neurology, for, um, oncology, you don't have to do all three years of IMT training. You can do two years and then apply for oncology or hematology. Um, one of the really scary daunting things about being to going into medicine in the UK is the medical registrar job, which is basically when you're the, in smaller hospitals, you're basically at night and out of hours running the hospital. Um, you, it's an extremely busy, stressful job uh, that unfortunately, even when you're doing cardiology, you're doing gastroenterology, it's basically a general medical on call. So it's not going to be specific to your specialty. And um, that's one of the major reasons a lot of people don't apply to, um, for medical training as such, because it is a very difficult, stressful job. Having said that, um, I think there's certain fields that you can you, that aren't on the acute medicine rota, and that would be rheumatology, neurology, infectious diseases in microbiology, hematology, and oncology, along with dermatology. Uh, dermatology is extremely competitive. Again, expect to have to take time out and apply separately uh, for things like dermatology. Um, if, for example, someone's very specific in regards to where they want to do their training, then if someone says, you know what, I only want to work in London, then you might have to take time out as well. Um, that's not to say that training in London is better than anywhere else. It's just that more people want to live close to. I think we should always keep an open mind. So if, if I said, if I got a job in Wales, I would go because training is going to be good regardless. Yes, there's some variation, but like we said, Certain centers can be good for, like, for example, some small hospitals may do a lot of procedures. Some small hospitals might refer you to bigger centers. But if you're in a specialist, if, I'm a do, if I want to do gastroenterology, I'm not going to spend all five years in one hospital. They're going to rotate me through smaller hospitals and bigger hospitals. So you get a very holistic view on the kind of medicine that's practiced everywhere. So it's not like you'll be lacking in training anywhere. TK? Um, so... Um, yeah, yeah. I think I can add that uh, for medical training, there's also a pathway called the acute care common stem. Yeah, yeah. Um, that specifically that, that, applies for acute medicine. Um, acute, uh, that includes uh, acute medicine, emergency medicine, yeah. potentially, and uh, anesthetics. So these but, three. Uh, but when you apply for an ACCS, or Q, that's with the abbreviation or Ali said, it's not interchangeable. So you can't you can't switch for, if you've applied as an acute medical trainee, you can't switch over to anesthesia, any anesthesia. And if you've applied as an ED, you can't switch over, but it's basically making doctors who are very good at acute care. So they give you enough clinical experience in all of these three fields so that you're good at intubation, you're good at running ITUs, et cetera. Um, so that's, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a viable opportunity. Again, these posts are limited, but, still not that competitive you will you if, if that if you want to do acute medicine that's a specialty in itself um geriatrics is a very big specialty over here um it's not the most fun but having said that for some people it might actually be interesting because you uh, it, it focuses a lot on your communication skills and ethics of it um yeah. palliative care is also a very good specialty that a lot of people go into um, that might not apply so much to Pakistan, but over here, it's a very big thing. Um, um, in, in geriatrics, I think, uh, I think when you look at it, things like uh, stroke come into geriatrics rather than neurology. Yeah. So that's one big difference. So stroke that, medicine uh, is different to neurology anyway. So they're two different subspecialization categories. Yeah. Um, so. There was a question about emergency medicine. 
that's a separate application. So at core surgical training, you will then either apply to ACCS, uh, which is the acute common care stem for emergency medicine or do course, core emergency medical training. So that's separate. Um, there's a question in regards to whether we can get the desired field. Um, what are the chances of getting a job after clearing all the exams? The chance of getting a core medical training job is quite good. The chances of getting gastro slash cardio specialty training, again, purely depends on how competitive your application is. Um, it's, it's still a national portal. There's still nas inter national interviews. So you have to obviously keep that in mind. Um, yeah. No matter uh, what you're applying for, you need to work yeah. hard for it. So the ideal time to give MRCP one, two and paces. So for the MRCP, it's different to the MRCS. So the MRCP, you have to have worked in the UK for a minimum of six months before being eligible to take the part one. Um, so basically what I would say is the ideal time to do your MRCP part one would be in F2. If you can finish your part two in F2, that would be great. I would say hold off on the paces until you've finished your, or done at least a bit of core medical training, because again, it's a clinical exam. You need to be, you need to be, um, you need to be good fluent. clinically and fluent clinically and very quick, not quick, but very thorough and being able to get through the station well and being able to pick up findings. Um, pay, people do fail all of the exams. The MRCP is a difficult exam. Part two is a difficult exam. And PACES is, I think, the hardest of the three. So people really struggle with the PACES. So I think it would be better not to rush the exam. Um, I, I don't know. I think I've spoken about neurology. Um, I think that's yeah, so much one, uh, one question question that uh, probably wasn't addressed in this talk was, uh, and you got recently, was how do we really prepare for the PLAB exam? Okay, yeah, so that's, so I think, like we said before, PLAB 1, you would do the past papers that you can get on this PLAB group. I know it's not a very uh, st straightforward response, but I, we, Ali and I basically use those past papers and we use the Oxford Handbook of Clinical Medicine um, and read through that, basically skimmed it. Okay. So there's a question that someone's asked about core medical training versus specialty training. In core medical training, you rotate through fields. So I've now got my core medical training job. So I'm going to be rotating through gastro. I'll be doing cardio. I'll be doing geriatrics, which is one of the mandatory ones. I'll be doing ITU and I'll be doing acute medicine as well as palliative care slash onc. So this is basically giving you a general medical training. So you're going to be dealing with a lot of medicine specifically. Um, in the third year, they still haven't really decided what we're doing with the third year. So I would just hold off and maybe have a session later on in my training to talk you through the actual or maybe do a specific medical training one. Um, the way one of the things that I think is specific to medicine is now the core medical training is three years, right? And it doesn't affect the total amount of time of training because now instead of starting specialty training as an ST3, you will start specialty training as an ST4. So in my last year, which my, is my third year of uh, uh, medical training, acute med core medical training, I will basically be essentially the same thing as a medical registrar, but I'll be covering acute or general medicine, which isn't the best when you want to do specialties, but I think it again, most people who come out of the UK are going to be dual accredited, accredited. So you'll be an acute medic as well as a cardiologist. You'll be an acute medic as well as a, gastro, as well as a gastroenterologist. A few fields, like I mentioned earlier, like neurology, oncology, rheumatology, um, microbiology and infectious diseases won't do acute medicine, but the rest of them are expected to do it throughout your training, which, which is, which is, get, which is the, suck, the, the part that sucks about doing medicine where Basically, you're expected to do acute medicine throughout your specialty training. So you will be, there'll be times where you'll spend a month outside of gastroenterology training, just doing the acute medical take, et cetera. But it's part and parcel of the training. I think it makes you a better doctor. All right. So now let's move on to uh, the comparison between the pros and the cons of uh, yeah. training in the US versus training in the UK. I think uh, so I saying think, uh, comparing the US to the well, UK, we can't compare it because we haven't experienced we haven't, it. Yeah, so I think it'd be we'd be reluctant to put to compare the two, but I think it'd yeah. be it'd be important for us to state what the pros and the cons are. And I think it's important for whoever's whoever's listening to the talk to basically then make their decisions. At the end of the day, we can't 
we're not selling it's not like an advertisement program but we we do wish that more people from pakistan do come in to the uk it builds a strong body of pakistani doctors and it it, it is good at the end of the day. but we can't obviously make people think in other ways so i don't think we want to we weren't ideally wanting to compare but like i think the pros that we can mention and the cons that we can mention are um yeah. pretty simple i think um starting off i think for people especially who plan to have family lives and plan to move here with their spouses or eventually obviously get married once they're training here and if their wives are working and i think the supply is to women more so um is less than full time training so let's say you do have a family you can always opt to work um and i don't know how i i, I don't know about other countries in regards to this but you can always work for example opt to work 60% of your working hours to basically provide you time to spend your training yes your training will take longer so they might add on a couple of years to your training overall but you'll get to spend more time with your family and your children etc during the formative years of their lives which i think is invaluable um that so the flexibility of training over here with less than full time training etc is i think is unmatched uh the next point i feel specifically for women obviously because men aren't physically able to do this but it's things like maternity leave uh, right so you get 9 months of maternity leave in the uk and 3 weeks of paternity leave in the uk as well so okay. Nine months in which you spend, I think, three months you get your original salary, so your complete salary you'll get. Three months, I think, you'll get um, half your salary, and then I think for and in all of this you can add your annual leave as well. So you, if you put your if you supposedly take your annual leave, you can then basically get your salary for longer. And I think it for three months then you don't you 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 don't you don't get salary cut, but you don't get paid, but you're Are basically allowed to stay off work nine months after having a child, which I think is amazing. Um, I think um, the work-life balance in England has been great for me so far. I really I've enjoyed training here. I feel I never again. You have difficult shifts. I'm I'm not saying that it's going to be easy. There's certain hospitals that are going to be understaffed. There's certain shifts that are going to be understaffed. Um, but I think. overall um i've enjoyed my time working here there's never been a point where i felt burnt out entirely like there've been days when i've taken on extra work myself like locums um and then burnt myself out but that was my own doing right so oh, it's only one person to blame for those things so you you do have a good work life balance um and i think things like being closer to pakistan like i said um, i i can fly back to pakistan f- f- again to meet my parents my parents my fa- all my families in pakistan so i can fly back to pakistan on a moment's notice god forbid if anything bad happens you can easily right. fly back to pakistan in the same day or you can make more use of your annual leave you spend less time traveling mm-hmm. i think that's a major pro for me at least cuz i think that really does help and i think this i'm going to end with this to allow ali to talk about his pros as well because i feel like i'm hogging this bit it's all right you <laughs> too i think I think um, the, the I think point, uh, I I'd agree with most of these uh, oh sorry just mentioned that one point yeah, so the other one the other point that I wanted to state is I feel training in the UK kind of gets you used to critically analyzing what you're getting done for each patient um justifying even the simplest of blood tests to be fair um because at the end of the day it's not something that you just bill to the patient or bill to whoever it's it's coming out of the hospital it's coming out of the uk taxpayers money so you have to really justify the investigations justify everything um that you're getting done i think that kind of medicine that you practice you can translate back to pakistan where not everyone can afford to get every test under the sun not everyone can afford to get all the investigations done at the same time and i think all of these things do make a difference um i think simple things like your ability to communicate with people uh from like you just share the sheer number of years that you do the fact that ali wants to do surgery but he's still gone through respiratory medicine he's still gone through geriatrics i've done anything, itu he's done itu it makes him a more yeah, well-rounded yeah. clinician because he's got experience much, he knows much, how yeah. to talk to old people 
he knows how to <laughs> talk to yeah it's true they they they, they can over here yeah. at least they yeah, can be very frustrating right and one of the yeah. common things that yeah. people talk about with surgeons is that they don't know how to talk to human beings right so <laughs> thanks thanks <laughs> so uh, so i think i think training over here if you look at the trainees and i think that's one of the big differences i've noticed if you look at the trainees the trainee surgical regs in comparison to the people who just come for staff grade jobs in terms of the communication skills there is almost no comparison i would say in terms of being able to talk to patients and at the end of the day that counts so much you can you can talk patients out of doing uh, out of being upset you can talk them out of complaining you can talk them in you can talk to them just about if someone just getting up and wanting to leave you can just talk to them nicely and they'll want to stay in the hospital it's a simple things like that mm-hmm. now ali the floor is yours please uh, well what i can speak about is that uh, well i agree with all the things about uh, the less than full time training uh, the maternity leave you get paternity leave as well yeah exactly uh, 3 weeks of paternity uh, leave 3 weeks but uh, although i think sometimes there's a certain limit and then after that you have to make it up later yeah. but that's that's a, uh, that's a matter for that time isn't it uh, you have flexibility i mean things are uh, because um it's written out for you it's a um, system based on merit and everything's written out for you what's a big pro is that because you are a certain kind of person because you are a certain kind of race because you are a certain kind of nationality or have a certain kind of orientation in terms of gender or sex uh or uh, you are not disadvantaged and uh things are attainable things are achievable as long as you are showing that you are of a certain standard um and that's that's what's important here uh to meet that standard uh i think being close to pakistan big plus uh I went back home three times last year in my first year showing up but I said uh uh because it's easy it's just easy that's what it is um and uh literally we get a week's notice from my mom come back I can go back yeah. get a holidays go back as long as you have holidays available I think I think uh, someone's asked a question uh, in the question section about whether where you get your training affects whether it affects the quality of your training um especially for surgical specialties i think i can speak for both surgery and medicine right now in saying that for specialist training they rotate you through multiple hospitals so you generally get a very similar training across most things yes there are going to be minor variations but overall you'll be going through tertiary care you'll be going through yeah. district generals so you'll generally get a pretty well rounded training i don't think it yeah, matters you, that you, much. you get placed in a deanery essentially uh, or an area and in yeah. that area you will have tertiary care hospitals uh, district hospitals as well like the um, the map you showed earlier the map i showed earlier in my area there's uh, addenbrooke's hospital which is a major trauma center there's uh, my hospital which is a dgh then there's talhas yeah. hospital which is in the same area yeah. which is a spinal center yeah. our major trauma goes to addenbrooke's our uh, spinal issues go to ipswich uh, yeah. so and uh, there's no vascular surgery in my area so all vascular trainees are at addenbrooke's yeah exactly uh, or at bigger centers plastic trainees are at bigger centers uh, there's no plastics at my area either there's uh, there's no uh, neurosurgery in my hospital so you you get uh, yeah. variation so example, in terms of uh, yeah and uh, accordingly like then the general surgery uh, sorry the orthopedic trainees that i know because uh, yeah. i'm interested in that i know them uh they've rotated in places like norwich ipswich addenbrooke's yeah. my hospital they get so very very of very experience yeah. and the same goes for all specialties so like i think the worry would be for someone who's like i want to do a procedural specialty in medicine as well would be that oh am i going to get access to certain procedures or will i just be stuck doing simple stuff so the question would be as a junior doctor you'd want to spend more time in smaller hospitals because you get more responsibility you get to do more stuff as you get more senior that's when you'd want to go to bigger hospitals yeah. like cambridge like norwich etc yeah now i think uh, my orthopedic surgery uh, general surgery is surgery that's done in all the district general hospitals it's specific stuff like spinal like neurosurgery i'm sure there's specific types of general surgery and specific types of orthopedic surgery that don't happen everywhere but the bare basics that you need to do to become a junior specialty trainee and to become really good at something 
they, I'm sure they have enough in most centers for you to be able to do. Um, and then when it's time for you to do more advanced stuff, you're going to be going to bigger centers anyway. I, I, Ali, I think, would you agree with that? Um, yeah, yeah. And for neurosurgery, if you're in neurosurgical training and they don't do neurosurgery in smaller hospitals, then they're not going to post you in small hospitals. They'll only post you in hospitals where you're doing neurosurgery. It's as simple as that. All right, so uh, one question that uh, came up was that if somebody did their residency in the US and they wanted to, for example, live in the UK, then is that a valid option for them? Is it possible for them to practice? So uh, for this, um, I think if you go to, if you go to the GMC website, uh, see what board qualifications are acceptable. Uh, and if you look at uh, specific I think it'll, it'll be take a bit of digging. I don't know the specifics off the top of my head because it's not okay, uh, something I like I've seen very, very commonly. Question. That's very niche. Uh, yes. Not many people come from the US to the yes, UK, yeah. to be fair. Uh, my, my question to that person, um, firstly, would be why? Are they completing their training in the US and then wanting to move here? Because they should have just done it here in the first place. Uh, yeah. if, but like, I, you don't see that very often, if I'm being honest. Um, I think... Again, I think Daniel, someone's asked about how many years in urology. It's going to be the same number of years. So it's going to be IMT1, IMT2, and then ST3 all the way to ST7 or ST8. Uh, for people who have joined kind of late, I think, uh, if they missed that part of the thing, you can go to the websites for foundation training. So it's yeah. called the foundation program. Uh, yeah. You can write that down. A second one is called Oriel. So O R I E L. Uh, yeah. Oriel. Go on that website. It's the application portal for all of these applications. Yeah. Um, you can go on it, search, and search for the closed applications and look for specific specialties. Yeah. You'll and be think... able to find exact. Uh, application exactly. guidance yeah, exactly. and what needs to be done accordingly. So important resources, I think, that we need to mention are. Uh, your um, Oriel as a website, the foundation program training website, core surgical training has its own website where it will tell you the specific requirements. Internal medicine training will have its own specialty website telling you about their requirements. And each specialty will have its own dedicated application area where it will tell you what the requirements are for those specific fields. Right. Okay, so all of this is readily available. It's a very streamlined process. Um, so I think that's something that everyone after this talk should be able to do um, and actually should go into so they know what, uh, what's, what's expected. I think there's a question from someone again, sorry, I'm just reading the comments about hijab slash niqab while working in the UK, which is, I think, a very important question. Um, there's, no, there's no problems at all. Um, no, nobody gives a second thought to it. No, no, not at all. Also, this meeting is recording and it will be available on the SIG and IMIG website um, pages. Okay, great. Yes, and we have just about crossed the two hour mark. So I'd like to ask one final question of the two of you. Uh, yeah. What is some advice that you can give to medical students right now who want to pursue their training in the UK and something that you maybe from your experience could have done differently that we can do now? Ali, you get started. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I think when I was... Uh, so it was kind of a uh, discovery by self and, uh, and as an extension, Talha was both of us being in the same batch, uh, kind of uh, having kind of the same goal. We uh, discovered everything by ourselves. We didn't really ask anyone about anything because uh, the information is available on the websites and stuff. Uh, thank God. Um, but uh, I think being, uh, having, being aware of the deadlines is an important thing. Yeah. Um, and when I applied the first time, I actually applied when I was finishing my final year of medical school. Um, my papers were sent one day late, so I couldn't apply that year um, for various reasons. So be careful about deadlines. I don't regret it, whatever happens. Um, and uh, I did uh, then the next year, I think overall in the grand scheme, I think that was probably for the better. But uh, then you have, uh, uh, other than that, uh, sorry, Talha, go ahead. I lost my no, train no, go of ahead. thought. No, no. <laughs> okay, fine. Yeah. So um, the question was basically what advice I'd give. I think 
number one is my number one advice to everyone is always keep your options open whether that's pakistan whether that's england whether that's the us look into everything don't and international relations international travel all of these things change all the time so always always keep your options open i think the core of this talk was to make sure that we explain to people that the uk is still a viable option for you to come to train to and we wanted to make it an attractive option for people to come and train uh, here as well i think a lot of people get daunted by the number of years training but i think what we need to remember is that at the end of the day you're still becoming a consultant and you're still going to become a very very qualified and able clinician um as far as advice goes as to what to do in terms of training specifically to come to the uk i would say maybe try getting involved with audits um in aku themselves um i think small poster presentations will go a long way um i think the um just looking at the points and understanding what people what the application wants from you will go a long way in terms of um um in terms of applying and i think there's the second the second thing that i would say is don't look too far ahead um i think look towards the next step of training get into the next step of training and once you're in that step of training then look towards the next the step after that don't look two steps ahead because and then unfortunately miss out on the step that you need to be going into you know what i mean so and i think the other thing that i wanted to explain to all my or all the fellow students and stuff is basically this concept of time um don't rush things like it it's it's okay to take your time figure out what you want to do um it's okay to take an f3 year so take a year out even after you have to um if you're not quite sure um it's okay to change specialties it's okay to go as an old trainee it's okay to go to do an extra degree all of these things will improve you as a person if you want to do surgery and get stuck in a stuck in a job that's medicine you're only going to be better for it you're not going to be any worse because you can't do that you'll improve your clinical experience number 2 keep you an open mind don't just reject jobs based on their location or based on where people are my my advice to everyone would be would be to get your foot in the door whether that's in wales scotland they have wonderful training opportunities everywhere whether it's a small town that you've not heard of uh keep your options open apply to all of these jobs um when it's time to apply um and then then just see where inshallah everything will go well and then uh, things will fall into place but the key is to not get too far ahead of yourself and just i guess get your foot stuck in the door first and then hopefully take it from there yeah i i would agree with that uh, get get in uh, then take it step by step i think that was a very important good point yeah. to emphasize uh take it step by step uh don't get ahead of yourself includes giving exams well if you're if you're going through down the FY2 pathway don't get ahead of yourself giving exams like the MRCS MRCP focus yeah. more on audits focus more on these things which will get you more points points yeah uh, so like your don't three, your 3 exactly. months your 3 months studying for the MRCS part 1 you can complete three audit projects present them at international conferences and you'll get points you'll get 12 more, more points 12 today. more points you'll get 12 more points mrcs gives you one point so you'll get 12 extra points just off doing that so there's a lot more uh, benefit to the work yeah i think there was also a question about after training in the uk um can you go practice elsewhere um from I think coming back to Pakistan as I said it's a very very relatable practice in fact we have a lot of consultants at AKU who are UK trained um we have a lot of consultants in Pakistan who are UK trained who are very good at what they do um and then I think places like the Middle East etc love people trainees from Pakistan coming from England coming back and working there yeah. um so that's that's one of the other the things that I had to say um so and I think The, there was a question that i just replied to on the chat so that's fine i don't think there's anything else and uh somebody is asking about doing fellowships and things of course you yeah. can go ahead and do that yeah. but yeah. you'd need to give your exams for going to that country things like yeah. that yeah um, yeah uh, the right time to give places as i uh, i would say is during your core medical training um you can't do your places before core medical training anyways so maybe within the first year or so
um, and the bare below elbow. Elbow, I don't think it's uh, too important, uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, oh, they, but I think I, I can understand where you're coming from, though, uh, if you're worried about uh, covering yeah, and if that's your tradition yeah. in terms of. Uh, uh, Unfortunately, it is one of the things. Yeah, it is one of the here. things they do here. Yeah. So you have to, regardless, maintain that you're bare below yeah. your elbows. I think, from more from an infection control perspective, um, the other thing that I wanted to mention, I don't know whether it's a relief to most or not, but we don't wear white coats here. Yeah. Um, so I, I personally hated wearing a white coat all the time. So I'm quite, I'm quite happy with that. Um, all right, so I think that's about it from us. I would like to thank Dr. Ali and Dr. Talha on behalf of the Internal Medicine and Surgery Interest Groups. And I want to thank all the participants who stayed with us for this long. I hope most of your questions about the UK pathway have been answered. And yeah, that's about it from us. The recording is going to be available. Thank you very much. And take care and stay safe. Thank you very much, Dr. Talha and Dr. Ali. Thanks for Thank you guys us. as well. Uh, I hope this helped and I hope we've kind of made this option more appealing to everyone. We would love to see more Pakistani faces that we remember. And new and new faces. And new faces, yeah, obviously. Um, I would I would really, really uh, we're, again we've been we when we when we are contacted personally, I think Ali and I both try our best to contact people and get back to them as soon as we can. Yeah. Um, and um, I would love to have more sessions. Don't, don't, don't worry about training. the time. Just, just send message, a message just, and we'll contact when we're free. We'll, yeah. Exactly. And yeah. you don't have to be formal at the end of the day. We yeah. only, no need to we're be not formal. that old. We, we yeah. graduated. I know we graduated four years ago, but uh, we're happy to help whenever. So I think there are a few questions that are very specific that we might not have been able to answer, but we can go, we can get into That's that. Okay. Uh, later on, so yeah, thank you guys for Salman awesome. Manzer. Thank you very much. For Appreciate all of this. You guys have done a great job, and I can no, almost guarantee to everyone who's <laughs> listening to this that none of this would have been possible without their hard work. So, yeah. good job, guys. Definitely. Definitely. All right. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Let's end the call now. Okay. Thank all you very right. much. See you guys. Bye. Bye bye. bye.